Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Shane Ostrom. I'm the finance and benefits guy here at the Military Officers Association of America. I'm joined by my compadre, Paul Frost, who's also our finance and benefits guy, and he adds a veteran service officer to uh, his particular resume here at MOA as he's our veteran uh, representative when it comes to VA issues. Uh, you know, as we get through this program today, you'll notice that you have a control panel on your screen. And that control panel, you, if you look down the control panel, you will see an area that says handouts. You have four handouts out there to include these slides. You may want to download those slides and handouts so that you'll have those for the rest of the show today. Uh, any, if you're not hearing me right now, I'm sorry. You might, <laughs> I don't know what to say because I can't give you any instructions at this point since you might not be hearing us. Uh, but also just to let you know, Every one of you who registered for this program are going to receive an email after this session is over within the next several days. And that email will have a link to the recorded session that's good for up to 30 days. So all you people out there that aren't listening right now, then you will receive this email. And those of you that are listening, uh, just stand by for your email. Check your spam folder. Sometimes when we send out emails and they have links in them, your whatever security uh, program you're using on your computer sees a link and automatically thinks it's spam. So check your spam folder. Anytime we send you anything out that has a link on it, check your uh, spam folder. Also, you know, at the end of this webinar, uh, after you sign out and all, there's going to be a survey pop up. And we would appreciate if we get your feedback at the end of this uh, session. Next uh, slide, Paul. Uh, for all of you folks that are attending this, you know, we've got almost 2,000 people that are uh, trying to attend this or at least registered for this webinar. Uh, and not all of you know anything about the Military Officers Association of America. So I like to start with just a very quick synopsis of us. We are an association of officers. And we believe that our role as officers and leadership within the military services community never stops, even after we, we leave the service and don't wear a uniform anymore. And those of you that are still in the service, obviously you have a leadership role to, to uh, continue your duty with. And so we are out there fighting every day up on Capitol Hill. Our charter is for pay and benefits. We do not get into service missions and we do not get into the hardware issues of the services. We're all about pay and benefits. We're people, people. Uh, and our tagline is never stop serving, and that is the truth. Here we are still serving long after we've retired, some of us. Uh, we're nonpartisan. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, as long as you're for what we're after. That's what it's all about. We're looking for people to support our pay and benefit programs, and we get support from all sides of the aisle. So. It doesn't do us any good to start isolating people or alienating people on the Hill because you never know where your support's going to come from and you never know who the people are that aren't going to support you because sometimes I get people that call me all the time thinking they got support and they don't. Uh, so it's important to remember, don't be partisan about these things. Just think about the issues. We're nonprofit and we're independent. Uh, we, we don't belong to any services. We're not a governmental agency. We're out there officers doing what we believe is necessary to support the troops and your families and all the folks that have worn the uniform. Uh, we're the fourth largest military service organization in the country. We're only behind the VFW American Legion and disabled American vets. So we've got a lot of members, but it's members that provide us the power up on Capitol Hill because anytime you're up on Capitol Hill, it's how many people we can bring to the battle that determines our success. And a lot of y'all out there, uh, you know of this organization called AARP. They get listened to because they have 38 million members. Membership matters. So if you're not a member of MOA, please consider joining us if you're eligible for membership at MOA because membership matters. How many we say we represent? And normally we're pretty successful too, because as officers in MOA that work on the staff, we've been there and done that when it comes to working up on Capitol Hill. We know Capitol Hill, we know its culture, we know its processes, we know how it works, and we know how to get things done. And we're not up there just to say, do this or nothing. We're up there to find solutions. And as a result, we get respect on Capitol Hill 
because we're people of action and solutions. We're not looking to just log jam up the system. Thank you very much. That's all I'm going to say about Mo at this point. We want to get on with today's program. Here you see my picture and, and Paul's picture. Uh, that's some really nice shots they took of us with a little Photoshop involved, but Paul really is that handsome. And as we go through this, uh, you'll know who you're speaking to now. So we want to start now with a bit of a legislative update. I like to start with a big picture first so that we all get a lay of the land. And then Paul and I are going to get right into the nitty gritty of what's going on. We want to thank all of you who have ever worn a uniform, those of you that are wearing a uniform now, and all of you and the families who have supported your uniform service member, because we're all a part of the military community and the service community, and we thank you all. And it's our pleasure and honor to go up on Capitol Hill to, to fight for all of you. Sometimes we get asked, you know, there's a lot of military veteran organizations in the country do you guys ever get together to work together as an org, as a, as a unit? And we do. We all fall under this organization, this umbrella called the Military Coalition. You see the 35 organizations that are represent the Military Coalition. If you don't see your organization in there, it chances are it's not because they don't want to participate. It's be, probably because they can't, because their charter does not let them but don't think that they're not in the background when we're all working together uh, as they all get a voice and we all work together. Now, of course, like any family, and we're all just a big family and when you look at these 35 organizations, like any family, we don't always agree on everything that we go forward with. So, but when we do agree, we represent about five and a half million people and that gets heard up on Capitol Hill. Uh, so look at these and thank you and membership matters. So hopefully you belong to some of these organizations, if not uh, several of them. Thank you very much. Next one. Okay, let's get started with a little bit of a legislative big picture. Let's lay out the land of the environment and then we'll go into some detailed of, uh, issues regarding pay and benefits in legislative actions. Look at these two charts on where the federal money goes, and I've just got the federal money broken down between these two big pieces of the pie, mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Mandatory spending is money that the people up on Capitol Hill, the elected representatives, aren't going to really be touching. They're kind of the third rail of politics. We're talking about Medicare, Social Security, and interest on the national debt. These things are pretty well locked in place. Unless they have to, unless they have to uh, mess with them, which eventually some of these programs have to be messed with. Discretionary spending, on the other hand, is what the elected reps can play with: increase it, decrease it, add to it, come up with new stuff, take away stuff, whatever the case may be. And so, discretionary spending, you see, is where we are when we talk about pay and benefits for service members. We're in the discretionary spending pot. And you see here how discretionary spending you know, over the last 50 plus years has gone from being two thirds of the pot of the federal government to now it's only one third of the pot. So we're scrambling now to try to do what we can within that one third piece of pie to try to deal with our pay and benefit issues. And trust me, every person up on Capitol Hill, all the thousands of people that go up there for their organizations of all kinds, and all these thousands of people all have their hands out for money and they're all looking to get their pet projects funded. And we're up against that group of people. Next one, Paul. So I already mentioned people are always asking me, well, what are these spending? What's the going on in the spending? Here's the mandatory spending. And as you see, I'm not gonna get into the details of these. I just want you to give you a flavor of what these are in the next one, Paul. And this is the discretionary. And the, the thing to notice with the discretionary is, and this is oversimplified, of course, but the idea here is that real, look at this, DOD and VA make up, when you put them together, make up the yeoman share of this pot, of this pie of money. And as a result, when people are looking for money for their project, guess where they go? They go to the DOD and the VA because all these other people that are on, these, on this share of this pie They've all got slivers of pie, and it's harder for them to always find money to give up. Uh, so as a result, we're the target that people come after. Next one, Paul. Now, the political environment right now, this is what we're going up against when we go up to Capitol Hill to fight for pay and benefits. 
trillions of dollars spent for the virus issues in the economies. What are we up to now? Like $5 trillion in appropriation bills now have been, have been uh, spent over the, over what, the last nine months or so? $5 trillion. You know, the, 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 the massive national debt is, was, like, was like 23 trillion or 21 trillion before these things even hit. And just like that, we add five more trillion dollars to the national debt. So it, all of a sudden now, are we gonna start seeing people up on Capitol Hill wanna get tight with the money? Maybe, maybe so, we'll, we're gonna have to find out, but that's what we're up against. The virus management, the unemployment issues, the restarting of the economy. You see all of these issues are front and center in today's media, in today's news media. And so you know these are getting all the attention and it's what all the politicians want to focus on and because it usually gets them the most media airtime and they're trying to appeal to their constituencies. Guess what? Pay and benefits in the services don't get a lot of media time because people really don't care. They're not the high button, hot, hot topic issues of the day. So as a result, this is where politicians get some face time in the media. Next place, please. Next one. This is what we're up against with military experience amongst our elected leaders. This is something that we always have to deal with. And you know, when you as a service member out there listening to this show, you, we all got to realize this is what we deal with. And the thing is, they don't know, the vast majority of the people that are elected leaders in the Congress and the Senate, they don't know what it's like to walk a mile in, my, in our shoes. And so also you have to realize this, it's not just the elected leaders themselves, it's their whole staff. And now we're talking about thousands of people involved in when you count their staffs in there and the staffs don't have military experience for the most part either. And so as a result, when you go up there to fight for pay and benefits for service connected issues, these people don't have a clue what you're talking about. And for the most part too, they also think you got it easy. They think that all the service members with all of our benefits and pay, we got it easy compared to the average Joes and Janes in America. And so as a result, when you go up on Capitol Hill fighting for pay and benefit for service members and your families, we have to try to train, educate, convince these people. There's a reason why these pay and benefits are like they are. It has to do with what's known as an all volunteer force. If you don't provide pay and benefits, that maintains the recruiting we need to keep an all volunteer force and maintains the retention, then you're gonna have to start considering the D word draft at some point if we can't maintain an all volunteer force. Nobody wants to talk about a draft. And so usually the draft is what keeps us in line up there on Capitol Hill when you talk about pay and benefits. But you always also have to talk about why do these benefits seem to the people that don't know any better why do they seem so much better than all the people that are just normal citizens in this country? And they don't, they don't understand or we have to convince them or educate them on the fact that our benefits are earned by service to our country. And as a result, the vast majority of Americans won't even serve one voluntary enlistment or tour of duty in the military. So evidently the, the premium you pay for paying benefits in the services it's so expensive when you when you consider what the value people place on service to this country. It's so expensive, the vast majority of people won't even try to serve the country. And so as a result, then we get into this situation where we have to go ahead and try to get them to understand these issues. Uh, you see here also what we talk about is pay and benefits. We see here that in the early 2000s, pay and benefit programs grew rather substantially uh, in those early periods. And, and normally what you get when you're up on Capitol Hill is that these pay and benefit programs, people think that we had it on easy street during the early 2000s. What these people don't know, and we have to educate them or train them on also, is the fact that pay and benefits were allowed to erode to such levels during the 1990s that it started to affect our recruiting and retention efforts. So as a result, we had to start bulking back up paying benefit programs during the early 2000s to just get them back up to par. This, this increase in these paying benefits in the early 2000s, this wasn't gravy on the potatoes or whipped cream on your apple pie. This was actually getting us back in par with what we should have been all along and it was allowed to erode. 
The other thing that we look at on here is what else happened here? 9-11, and we were fighting wars over in the Middle East on two fronts. And people think, they don't re seem to think that these things cost money to have to run these shows. So as a result, that's where this is. But you see, since then, it has started to peter out again. And that's why it's important for us to constantly be up there harping on pay and benefit issues because it's always the same. We get these things up to scratch and then they're allowed to erode again. And then we get them back up to scratch. It's that old pendulum that we always talk about when we were in the service. Next one, Paul. The other thing you hear about up on Capitol Hill is that pay and benefit programs are eating the DOD's lunch. It's meaning that it's taking up more and more of their budget and it's just starting to cost DOD so much to just keep paying benefit programs up that they can't run missions anymore and they can't bear, buy hardware and on and on and on and train the troops, you name it. Well, that's not true at all. And we've had to show people up on Capitol Hill that the proportion of the DOD budget when it comes to pay and benefit programs for personnel, it's no more proportion today and even less than it's been in the past 30, 40 years. So as a result, pay and benefits hasn't really eroded away the DOD budget. It's maintained itself and even saved some money over time through various budget uh, exercises or, or various management techniques. So this is also a misconception that we have to battle all the time because a lot of people in DOD talk about it eating their budget up, pay and benefit programs. Just not true. Next one, Paul. Let's talk a little bit about some of our priorities going into uh, 2022. So this is the current uh, budgets that are out there right now. They're out there working, being discussed. And if they're passed, then these are things that will be taking effect in 2022. So let's go, Paul. So what we're talking about here, though, is this is where you make an impact. These things are being discussed. These things are out there on the table now. And if we're gonna make an impact, now's the time to go online to your elected representatives and let them know this is what's on your mind and this is what you want their support in. Now, MOA has a massive amount of priorities uh, and there's a, a large laundry list of things that we know need help, need reforms, need some bulking up into. And so this is just a partial list. We're always reviewing things. We're always out there looking for new items. We're seeing what pops up on the radar screens that we might not have seen, but they just pop up during the mid year. And so we're always on top of these things. But the biggest things, and based on what we, me and Paul especially, we hear a ton of people uh, talk, they always want to talk about healthcare, healthcare, healthcare. That's what it's all about. The majority of the people care about healthcare. So, the majority of our time and effort is placed on healthcare initiatives. Uh, and one of the biggest healthcare initiatives is trying to keep down the cost of healthcare on beneficiaries because we've already paid our premiums in these to have these healthcare programs, these benefits, by the fact that we had to serve 20 to 30 years of our young adult lives to have these benefits. We've served the greatest premium of all to get these. So we shouldn't have to keep facing disproportional fee increases. As a result of that, it's something that we go up against DOD all the time because from the DOD perspective, if they can get us to pay for more of these healthcare benefits, then they don't have to spend as much on the healthcare benefits and maybe they can spend money elsewhere, use money in other areas they'd rather spend money on. So healthcare is a big thing. We've got issues with pay, of course, and the big thing in pay is the fact that your retired pay is offset or reduced by the fact that you get VA compensation on the side for a VA for a disability, service-connected disability. We're trying to get that fixed. Paul, we're, Paul will go into more details on some of these later, but you see the rest of these things are VA related, they're service pay related, uh, there's guard and reserve issues out there that we've got to get fixed. And then some things on the other services too, pay and benefits with the Coast Guard, Public Health, and NOAA folks. Next one, Paul. So let's go into a couple of these that we're currently working. We're always working on currently serving pay. So these folks still, they're currently in the service. They're serving their country right now. What you're seeing on this chart is that by law, currently serving pay is supposed to be on par with the employment cost index, which is a, a, an index that's used to measure compensation in the nation. 
And as a result, military pay should be comparable with the nation's pay comparability. Uh, you see from this chart, pay comparability would be at the top of this chart where the 0% is that goes across, and that would be pay comparability. Anything that's a red line that's hanging down from the top, top bar indicates we're not at pay comp comparability. We're, we're lacking in pay. And you see there's only three years in there where we actually reach what the law expects it to be. And then we slid back down again. And now we're still a few point percentage points underneath pay comparability. We always fight every year for pay comparability for currently serving members. Next one, Paul. On the legislative goals, here's some other of the specific programs. There's some legislative uh, works out there, some drafts right now on laws that are that are out there to increase the DIC payment for survivors. Uh, right now, the DIC payment is, is a flat rate for all survivors. DIC is a survivor payment administered by the VA. Uh, and as a result, if a military member veteran dies of a service-connected cause, then that survivor becomes eligible for DIC. DIC stands for Dependency Indemnity Compensation. So uh, all the survivors out there right now who's, who lost their spouse due to a service-connected cause, they all get $1,358 a month. That, and any payment from the VA is always tax-free, and that's why you never get a 1099 because it's not reported to the IRS. Uh, what we are fighting for right now is that is, we're looking for a bit more in DIC survivor payments. And one of the one of the proposals out there is that the DIC survival payment would be the greater of the $1,358 a month or 55% of a veteran's disability compensation. So the survivor would get the, the whichever is the greater of that. Uh, the 55% of a veteran's disability amount would, would mimic then the Survivor Benefit Program, SBP, that the DOD administers and the, that the other uniformed services have. So we would like to see it somewhat equivalent to that. Uh, we would also like to see DIC for the survivors uh, made so that you could remarry at age 55 and not lose the payment. Right now it's 56, it was 57 last year, now it's 56, we need to get it down to 55. That's mainly just that way so DIC and SBP will both match as far as their remarriage age. Concurrent receipt, that's where your retired pay is reduced because you get VA pay on the side for a service-connected disability. Concurrent receipt means I, I receive both my retired pay and VA compensation concurrently. I can receive them concurrently. And right now, not everybody gets concurrent receipt. Not everybody gets their retired pay bulked back up if they get VA pay. So we're fighting to get a concurrent receipt for more people. More people get back their retired pay. Uh, increasing the death gratuity too, which is the insurance, part of the insurance if somebody loses their life while on active duty. Next one, Paul. And then here's a number of other ones. Now there's always a number and I, we're not gonna, I can't go into all of them uh, as it is. You know, these are the main ones that we go into. Like to see increased amounts in aid and attendance. This is another VA program for long-term care. We get, to Paul and I get a ton of calls uh, because people call us up and they say, what kind of benefits do I have for long-term care? Because I'm gonna have to go into assisted living or something like that, or I'm gonna have to have home health care aid come into my house. Where can I get some assisted living or some sort of long-term care? The only places that have a long-term care benefit, if you don't pay for it out of your own money, POTS, or if you don't have a long-term care insurance policy, the only other places to turn are the VA, and we would like to get a few of these aid and attendance amounts uh, bulked back up. And then you see there's a number, some VA health care issues, the health care cost again, uh, and on the Guard and Reserve side, there's also some health care costs and other issues that we're trying to get fixed over there. Next one, Paul. 
Defending against the healthcare benefit erosion is probably the one that gets the most attention at MOA because it's the one we hear from our members and people the most about is all the healthcare issues. I've already kind of mentioned that earlier. You know, the, a few years back, uh, under a, a law that was passed a few years back, all of the individual service medical operations were consolidated under the one defense health agency umbrella. And the idea, of course, was to find savings. We're going to find efficiencies and effectiveness by consolidation and elimination of redundancies is the idea. And that is a good thing. For us taxpayers, we want to find savings because we don't want to have the high cost of redundancies and inefficiencies and things like that. So as a result, for taxpayers, that's a good thing. Not so good if you put your service retiree hat on, though, because the fact that they find these efficiencies and they're able to find savings through these consolidation methods and or the way that they're coming up with these reforms, when they do find them, sometimes that means we, on the other hand, lose some of the access to the care that some of you become quite familiar with in your area. Access to care could mean that a clinic or a hospital is, is closed down. Access to care could mean that particular uh, services within the hospitals are no longer available. And we know of some cases of this where some of the service populations in some areas were kicked out into the community because the military hospital no longer offered those services anymore due to cutbacks uh, and save, savings that were found. Uh, and so it's our belief as an organization that we put our efforts into protecting your earned benefits and, and making sure that we maintain this all volunteer force. Next one, Paul. I've just got a couple more and then I'm gonna turn it over to Paul to get into some specifics on some of these programs we've got. Next one, Paul. Some of our slides take a little longer because there's so many people on board uh, that it slows down the process as we go through this with the computer. But hey, folks, I mentioned to you a little earlier, this is the time to take action. This is a time to contact your elected reps. While they're talking about these programs, we need to be bringing some, some they don't know about. So we need to bring some of these programs and bills to their attention. Some we need to let them know we want their support on these things. Your, your voice matters. You may think it doesn't, but it does because they collect the data. And as they collect the data on who's calling and emailing them and all, they find out what the people's interests are. And mathematically, one person calling about something statistically means there may be hundred, dozens or hundreds or thousands of people that are also interested in it, but they just haven't called. So every little call helps. And so as a result, well, you might say, well, Shane, how do I know what to call up Capitol Hill, my elected rep, to tell them about? Well, you go online to the MOA site, takeaction.moa.org. Uh, really dirt simple. Thanks. I learned that from my Army buddies. And so as a result, you go online to takeaction.moa.org. You can see the key bills that we listed them for you, the ones that are out there that are, we're battling to fight for and try to get past, and you jot them down, find the ones that you're interested in, which key bills you're interested in. Then you plug in your zip code into that other circle that says go next to it, plug your zip code in there, and you pull up, it'll pull up your elected representatives and give you their email address, or it gives you their mailing address, and it gives you their telephone number. So you can do whatever you wanna do, and you say, hey, so-and-so, I need your support or you to co-sponsor these bills because these bills are important to us in the military veteran communities. And that's what you need to do. And if enough of us do that, we know from our own experience here at MOA, it works because when we go up to Capitol Hill, A, we'll have some support where we might not have expected support because people have been calling in or emailing or calling or writing in. And also what it does is it, it, it opens a door that they may be now interested in learning more about that subject matter. So when you go in there to visit them and you talk to them about it and they say, hey, I've had calls or emails about this umpty squat. Can you let us know what this is all about? Because evidently it's important to some people. So we get kind of this warm introduction 
to some of these folks where we might have had to go in there cold otherwise. Next one, Paul. Okay, Paul, I think I'm turning it over to you, man. So good luck. Later. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, Paul Frost here. So I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we were able to achieve uh, in last year, and that's the elimination of the DIC dependency and indemnity compensation offset of the survivor benefit program. It was a long, long, long fight uh, over 10 years, but we finally got it uh, approved and signed. So the first year, uh, basically we signed at the end of 19. So 2020, there were no changes. DIC was fully offsetting SBP uh, last year. Starting this year, surviving spouses in their February payment should have seen the first phase in, which is uh, of the elimination of the of the DIC offset. Um, and <clears throat> anyone previously who um, had DIC offsetting SVP, you were refunded your premiums based on a pro rata level. Okay, so um, if it was offsetting 50%, you got 50% of the premiums your veteran retiree paid into the program. They will not be taking that money back for, from you. That's going to be yours to keep. It's already, I'm sure it's already been spent. Um, so if you chose child, what they're going to do is they'll continue to pay the child until the child ages out. And then come 2023, if, if the child doesn't age out before 2023, we expect sometime in 2022, they'll send letters to the, to the surviving spouses who chose child um, because they knew that uh, the DIC was going to offset their SPP. So they chose child. Well, they will have a chance to get an SPP back, okay, starting in 2023. So how does it work? The offset, basically, if it was less than the, the that year's DIC, which for 2021, it's $1,357.56, which we rounded up to $1,358, you are basically totally offsetting um, SBP. Uh, back in 2012, Congress, because they knew this was so egregious, Congress instituted SSIA, Special Survivor Indemnity Allowance. It started off at about a hundred, little over $100. Um, and so that's coming back to at least partially make up for the offset. Um, now it's gone all the way up into $327 in 2021. So you'll, you'll see the actual SBP payment turns out to be that SSIA. This is taxable. Anything from the VA is always um, tax free. So if the surviving spouse was met, had $2,000 in SBP, um, her, her net, his or her net SBP would have been $642 in February 1st. You're going to get your S SSIA, and then so the actual payment is that $642 plus uh, nine, uh, the 327 for 969. So how is it working? Here's the first year. So as I said, they're only subtracting two thirds of the DIC, so two thirds of, 50, of 1358 is $905. So if the SBP payment was $1,500, you end, end up subtracting 905, your net SBP is 595, therefore you, with the SSIA, you're getting $922 uh, instead of the 1500. In, in 2022, Instead of 905, it will be two thirds, and we and I'm using 1358. We know there'll be a cola increase most likely, so the, this number will adjust based on what the new cola amount for DIC is. If it's the 1.3 percent like it was the last year, they'll it'll go up, you know, uh, 17 or 18 dollars. So the offset will be reduced as well. So you can see here in 2022, the surviving spouse would get 1,047 plus the SSIA of 327. So the net um, SBP payment would be 1374. In 2023, after this two year phase in, starting in your February payment, which is for January, the, the surviving spouse will have the full SBP paid. So you'll get a, a check from DFAS or from the Coast Guard agency, pay agency. Um, so you get your full SVP. However, at, you'll get your DIC from the VA. At that time, SSIA will go away. And from then on, 
uh, the surviving spouses will receive full SVP and full DIC. Okay, uh, most of you know, the uh, come January 1st, TRICARE Select um, started a new enrollment fee. We had never had in standard or and now select starting in 2018, never had an enrollment fee before. So this was a surprise to a lot of people, even though Mo was putting out as much information on this as we could. So, um, so those of you who defaulted, if you didn't enroll in Prime, you were defaulted to select and you would have been dropped from select if you didn't set up a payment method, which typically they wanted to come out of your retired pay. There is no enrollment for medical retirees, those currently serving, uh, and then survivors of an active duty or uh, death or medical retirees. Um, again, COLA will ap apply to these enrollment fees in future years. The deductible is still out there, so $150 enrollment fee for individuals and $300 for family also matches the deductibles, $150 and $300. The deductibles should not increase by COLA, um, only the enrollment fee. Um, SBP, you can't use your SBP. Unfortunately, surviving spouses have to set up another um, another enrollment method on how to pay to stay in, to, in select. Um, and then TRICARE Prime remained at $3,000 for the catastrophic cap, but select went up to $3,500. And this is for retirees only. The, the active duty folks, it remains at 1,000. And we expect that this will increase by COLA in the future years. This all came out of the 2017 NDAA. So it's taken four years to implement this, but we've known about these changes and we put this information out as, as often as we could to our membership. Um, but so un unfortunately, not everybody reads the magazine, gets our newsletter, tunes in to our webinars. And so they, you know, they say, well, when did this occur? Well, it occurred in the 2017 NDAA. Um, the open season, again, if you wanna change from prime to select or select to prime, you have to do it during the open season, which runs um, typically, it's, it's been for the last six years that I've been doing this. It's the second Monday in November to the second Monday in December. So for this year, that'd be November 8th to, uh, 2000, or excuse me, to December 13th, and those changes, part of that NDAA change, 2017, TRICARE moved from a fiscal year, October 1st to September 30th, to a calendar year, now January 1st to December 31st. So if you want to make changes, you have to do it during the open season, um, unless you have what's called a qualifying life event then that allows you to change at the time of the qualifying life event. Typically you have to do it within in 60 days of that qualifying life event. Um, let's see, I think I covered all of that. So um, if you don't wanna change, you will automatically ro roll over to the, to the same program for the next year. Um, the same thing happens for FedVIP, for your dental and vision plans. And that's why during the open season, we tell folks, hey, check out what the new costs are going to be because you may not be satisfied if you, if you have a significant increase. Um, because if you, do not ch if you do not change or cancel your FedVIP plan, um, you're going to be rolled over for the next year. Anything, any changes for TRICARE for Life? We know a lot of the folks on this uh, webinar are probably under Medicare and TRICARE for Life. Since I've been here, the first year I joined MOA back in 2015, there was a proposal for the next year and a half or two years that we they wanted to have an enrollment fee based on your income, what your retired pay was. Uh, they wanted to have an enrollment fee for TRICARE for Life. Thankfully, nothing's gone on since about 2017. They've not brought this back up. So um, that's a good thing. So right now, and we've not heard any discussion. Every new Congress, um, the uh, Congressional Budget Office always pulls out you know, this, this recommendation of how to save money. And so in that is always, hey, charge for TRICARE for Life. But we've not seen, our, our lobbyists up on Capitol Hill have not seen any uh, any push to to actually act on that uh, proposal to have a TRICARE for Life enrollment fee. And we, we pay attention to this very, very strictly. Um, wanted to show you this. This also came out of the 2017 NDAA. So starting January 1st, we had the first increase of um, generics 
uh, from zero to seven dollars from Express Scripts. That took a lot of people by surprise. Again, but we've known and we've published this that they did a 10 year schedule and every two years they go up. So this year, come January 1st, generic retail went from 11 to 13. You can see them all there on the slide and generic from Express Scripts went up seven to $10. Okay, so it'll stay the same for the next two years. Then we'll get another increase probably in 2023, another increase in 25, and then you can see the final price there in 2027. Sometime around the 26, 27 timeframe, I'm sure they'll, they'll come out with the next 10 year rate increase uh, for our prescription drugs. Thankfully, as long as you still have access to a military treatment facility, we're lucky enough in the national capital region, there are plenty of pharmacies uh, on bases around here that we can use. Uh, for those of you who don't live near a base, uh, you don't have the luxury of being able to get your medic meds from the military treatment facility pharmacy. And so far, there has been no proposal to, to take that benefit away from us. Okay, some VA issues that have, that have come out here recently that I wanted to bring up. Uh, there's um, the 2021 NDAA that got signed uh, earlier this year, or late last year, um, added three new presumptive Agent Orange conditions with, that we've been waiting on for a very, very long time, that the Congress and the military service organizations, veteran service organizations, got tired of the VA dragging their feet. And so they went through legislation through the NDAA to say, no, VA, you're going to presumptively uh, uh, service connect these three conditions um, for agent orange exposure so uh, they have not uh, they have not approved or finished the policy and procedures work that they say they need to do um, we've been poking them and bugging them saying hey when are we, when are you going to do this what i want to get out to everybody is file a claim if you've developed one of these three conditions file a claim the VA is not, should not, they should not deny it because they know this is coming. It'll just sit there though until they finish their policy and procedures work, uh, their admin work to be able to, to adjudicate it. And you're, you will go, you, your um, award date should go back to the date um, that you submitted the claim or put in the intent to file. There is a proposal um, in the, uh, that's going through both houses of Congress called the Fair Care for Vietnam Veterans Act of 2021. Hypertension was supposed to have been, was originally going to be in the 21 NDAA. Then the Senate, it was either the House or the Senate took it out and said, hey, we were waiting on a study. Well, that study has been out. So now there's both houses of Congress are trying to add hypertension and this new monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. It's a protein that exposure to Agent Orange, it's a protein that get developed in your body from that exposure and, um, and then could cause cancers, typically blood cancers uh, in the future. So as long as it, as when, if you're tested and you, they find that you have this MGUS uh, protein in your body, they should start monitoring you for uh, the chance of developing typically a, a bloodborne di uh, disease, cancer. Okay, um, the the president did sign that the VA could vaccinate all eligible veterans, even if you're not enrolled in VA healthcare, spouses and primary and secondary caregivers. However, right now the VA, at least in in certain areas, you have to check your area. In the DC area, the VA is saying they don't have access to enough vaccines, so they're still only doing veterans who are enrolled in healthcare, not priority group eight, um, but enrolled in healthcare. And once they get more of a supply, they will open it up to all veterans, spouses, and caregivers. Uh, and then toxic exposure. Um, this has been a hot topic. There are a number of different bills that are being proposed. I only mentioned one here, the Veterans Burn Pit Exposure Recognition Act. What this is supposed to do is to at least acknowledge that veterans all over the, the globe, they've added some additional countries, the Philippines, I know um, a couple of others, but those who are exposed in Southwest Asia um, are going to, to be in a, a registry and then 
uh, as they determine by scientific basis, they determine things that can be presumptively presumed if you were exposed to a burn pit. So we've got, this is just the beginning is what I'm trying to get to. This is just the beginning. This has got a long way to go before uh, they'll, they'll have the actual diseases that will become presumptively service connected. But this is a, a very hot topic in Congress. Arlington National Cemetery, this is a big issue for most of our members. So um, the, the Federal Registry comment period ended last year. The Army is going through a legal review. However, um, and we thank everybody who, who uh, the CTA is our call to action. We had 30-something uh, thousand uh, MOA members who who reacted to our CTA and, and wrote into uh, their congressional rep, wrote, called, uh, emailed their congressional reps to, to get them to reconsider this. So what has happened since is while the Secretary of the Army is still working this, the SecDef released the old advisory council, okay, and is expected to appoint a new advisory council sometime in this year or next year. So the bottom line here for everybody is there these changes we don't expect will go into effect. And in fact, there'll be a set, another proposal and they'll go through the whole rigmarole again of putting it out on the Fed, you know, whatever the new, new advisory council uh, determines and they'll put out uh, the, the new proposal. Um, again, if, if SecDef decides to allow Secretary Army to put forward the proposal again, um, I, I'm not sure where that will go. But this is what this is the way our government relations team briefed me on where they think this is going. Uh, that we'll get a new advisory council and they'll take time to come up with a new proposal on any changes to Arlington National Cemetery. So anybody out there listening, the, I don't expect it's going to be at least a year to two or three years before any changes would go into effect. And we hope and we push that. Any current uh, members who are eligible, not just members, any cu current veterans who are eligible for internment into Army National, uh, Arlington National Cemetery will be grandfathered in. That is that is our push, and that's what our members um, asked us to do. Okay, this is, I think, my last slide. Um, just want to give you a co update. You, you should know a cost of living adjustment was 1.3 for 2020. Um, that went into effect January 1st of 2021. Um, it's currently right now 1.4%. So if it ended today, you get a 1.4%. But as you can see from last year's track, the dotted, dotted lines, it fluctuates throughout the year. Right now it's it's peaking, but who knows if it, it could take a downturn. But right now it's 1.4%. And you can, you can track this on our website. Okay, the last slide is our MOA calendar. Uh, you can just see um, our events coming up. Uh, we do a lot of transition issues um, for those getting out of the service, um, and then also how to maximize your, your overall compensation package. And then that the last one there is MOA's Military Executive Transition. That's a full day executive TAP class that we produce um, that uh, is get, gets typically rave reviews. That's the only one that we charge uh, thing charge a fee to attend, and these all been attending virtually. Um, since the pandemic, you can you can see all of our transition events. If you're a member, MOA member, you probably get alerts when we announce one. Um, but you can always go to our www.moa.org and go to the events calendar and see what we've got upcoming um, if that interests you. Okay, Shane. Um, remember, uh, as you exit, there'll be a survey. We we truly appreciate it if you'd answer the survey. Okay, Shane, you with me? I'm with you. I've been answering a lot of the questions, but there's still just a few out there that uh, need answers. Okay. Yeah. Let me go ahead and I'm, I've been putting um, some of the questions on the on the slide so that people can see them. Uh, let me go ahead and switch to that. No, that's not what I wanted to do. I think 
think most of these, Paul, that there are the few that are still remaining, they're all very specific VA questions. Okay. So I tried to answer most of them, but some of them are a little bit beyond my experience level on the VA issues. Okay, how can we get the years prior to 9-11 to get on the registry? We had locations, i.e. Honduras, where is occurring and no one is accepting it. Um, I, haven't, I haven't seen the, the, uh, the full list, um, but how can we get the years prior? The, the, um, anybody who participated in the first Gulf War can get into the registry. Uh, I'm not sure why you're saying you can't, um, because you can. <laughs> Um, let's see. Does the toxic exposure bullet include Camp Lejeune? Camp Lejeune is its own um, is its own presumptive case. So, and we already know we already know which um, which diseases, which cancers um, are on that presumptive list. So. Um, you know, there's, is it toxic exposure? Yes, but it's got, already got its own, like, like Agent Orange. So I'm not sure what you're, Ken, what you're asking there. I noticed the Navy League is, um, is not a member of the military coalition. Is it because their charter, you'd have to ask the Navy League, we, uh, the military coalition, there are some, you notice that the American Legion isn't on, on the uh, list as well. It's up to each organization, whether it's in their, um, whether it's in their charter or not, uh, it's up to them whether they want to, whether they want to join or not. I'm looking at some of the earlier stuff. Okay. I'll go ahead while you're looking for other other VA issues. Uh, the questions uh, the, it, the question here is this I just logged in. Will the webinar be recorded? This webinar is recorded, and everyone who registered, whether you attended or not, everyone who registered is going to get an email in the next several days with a link to the recording of this webinar. So, when the email goes out, because it has a link, a lot of y'all's spam and virus protection software, security software on your computers reads it as spam and it may put it in your spam folder, but it is out there. So it will be out there. Also, all MOA members, premium and life members have access to all MOA webinars all the time. So um, that's something you can look if you want to go ahead and look at the webinars that we have online. So no changes to Arlington National Cemetery for a couple of years or more. That is my best guess. I can't say that definitively because the Secretary of the Army or SecDef may change their mind. But right now, and con but Congress is also very interested in this. So um, if they did decide to push the, the proposed changes, <clears throat> I don't know that Congress wouldn't put a stop to it, but but am I 100% certain of that? No, but right now there are no changes being implemented. Okay. Um, there's a question on here about our, when we go up on Capitol Hill as a mass organization, it's called Advocacy in Action now. Uh, and they're asking, can we provide the number of MOA members in each congressional district and the number of retirees active duty? All of that is done as a part of the advocacy in action. All this information goes out as a part of it. It's something that is worked through our government relations office. So hang tight. I'm sure you're going to get all of this as the programs. This is new for us to do it virtually and under the advocacy in action banner. So. Uh, it's all going to come out to you because it's all part of what we do to put together this program. Our military base is going to keep the retirees from using the base services, medical and recreation after COVID-19 restrictions are removed. I, I, uh, that's going to be up to each commander. 
Um, some bases are, aren't restricting. I mean, I, I've, I'm at TRICARE Prime at Fort Myer, and I've, I, I've gone in to get my meds. I've gone in, I've had a couple of appointments. Um, some are done virtually, some are done um, in person. Um, I, I recently had an x-ray done. So, I mean, it, it's up to the base. I know a lot of, the re a lot of bases have, have, have denied um, access to recreation. Again, that's, not, that's a base commander's decision. That's not something that MOA can intercede on. But I think the medical is really is also a, a medical commander's decision. And some places I know are allowing retirees continued access. Um, I don't know of anyone specifically that's not. To me, if you're in TRICARE Prime enrolled in that medical facility, you, you should be treated just as anybody else who's in that medical facility. Um, but I, I, I don't know that definitively. Here's a question on here about, is there no concern in Congress that some enlisted personnel qualify for the SNAP program? You know, this is one of those things that comes around and goes around on a regular basis. I mean, when I was on the joint staff, back in the 1990s, this was an issue because a word got out through the media that there were enlisted people on food stamps. Uh, and here we are again, you know, the more things change, the more things remain the same. Uh, and so as a result, yeah, there is concern about it, but trust me, there's gonna, just like there was in 1990 when I was on the joint staff, this was getting all kinds of media attention. And when the media attention is focused on something, all of a sudden everybody's scurrying around to figure out what's going on up on Capitol Hill and in the Pentagon. Uh, you can be sure there's plenty of people out there and it's going down through the chains of commands to figure out what is the real problem here. Back in 1990, the real problem, when you boil it all down back in 1990 and the whole issue with the food stamps tended to be that individuals, there wasn't any mass problem but individuals had, there were some individuals with financial difficulties for various reasons, uh, and these things were looked into and dealt with. Uh, but there wasn't any mass hysteria back in 1990. We'll see if it ends up being the same this year. Um, are surviving spouses permitted to receive meds at a base pharmacy VA centers? Well, unless you're in CHAMP VA, no, you're not going to be able to get med meds at a, a VA center. Um, for the for the base pharmacy, as long as you have a military ID card, a, a, a dependent ID card, yes, you have access to base pharmacies. Um, someone's asking about why MOA doesn't do, why aren't we doing Zoom? We're changing this platform. This is called GoToWebinar. We're changing to something that's called ON24. And so uh, Shane, this has the capability to turn on a camera, but Shane and I, want you to be focused on the slides. In the future, ON24 will probably be more on camera because it, the, it's, a, and it's a much more extensive platform. So um, um, we start using that in May. So this, this may be Shane and, and my last uh, on GoToWebinar if we, if we do our training on ON24. So you may see us in the future. Yeah, you know, we could have our camera on, like Paul said right now, then I'd have to get out of my PJs to do these things. Uh, not, not really, folks, obviously. Uh, the question is, can basic members and non-MOA register, folks that are non-MOA, register and join MOA webinars when they occur? You bet. Uh, our webinars are open to everybody. Uh, and then the email that goes out after the webinar has a link to the recorded session that's good for 30 days if you're not a MOA Premium or Life member. Uh, if you are a MOA Premium or Life member, you have access to these all the time. Not just these, but every webinar MOA offers, and there's a lot of really cool webinars out there that we offer. Shane, why don't you, you take this one? You, you've answered this one quite a bit. Which one? The, those that got out after Desert Storm. Uh, those that got out, I've got a few, I think. Is it taken out of this? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I got, uh, so, okay, the, the question, the, the situation is, is that some people who got out of the service through an early separation or an early retirement, and when they did that, they got, they got a payout at the time that they that they got out of the service due to this early separation. 
And then these folks would go back into the service, usually in the guard or the reserves, and they would continue to serve in the guard and reserves. Eventually they would earn retirement and retirement pay and benefits. But when you earn the retired pay and the retired pay benefits, uh, then what happens is DFAS and the DOD, they come after you for that money they paid you uh, back when you first got out. The issue, and then there's always the question about the taxes, because when you got paid these, these monies back in when you separated, they took taxes out because it was income, taxable income, and they took taxes out. Now, when DFAS and DOD come after you and they want the, they, they come back for the money, uh, they want the full gross amount at back and, and you don't, they don't go after just the net amount after taxes, the part that actually hit the, pay, the pocket of the individual. They go after the full gross amount. Okay, this is a very complicated topic to get into on this particular webcast, but let me just say, here's what happens. And I'm just going to boil it down to the simplest of the IRS tax code rules. Back when you separated, you got paid this, this separation money, and it was taxable income, and you paid taxes on it. Now that you're retired, and they're docking your retired pay to help re, to basically re get that money back from you uh, is what they're doing, because you can't be paid that separation pay, which is considered an advanced on retired pay is what that was. And now that you're getting retired pay, they've already given you that advance. So if you want your full retired pay, then you end up having to give back that, that separation pay. Well, the thing is, is that what's happening now is they're not coming back. Let's just say you got paid 20 grand or, or 50 grand or whatever when you separated from the service and you paid taxes on it. They're not coming back to you and saying, I want that 50 grand back. I want that 50 grand that we paid you. So I want you to write me a check for the money that we paid you and you pay me back. They're not saying that. If they said that, then you would have a refundable tax issue where you could file an amended tax return because you got paid 50 grand, they took taxes out, and now you're going to give them back the same 50 grand they paid you. Uh, after you had already paid taxes. That would be uh, an, admitted, an uh, amended tax return situation because you got paid, you paid taxes, and now they want the payback for the very same money that you pay taxes on. What they're doing now is subtle, but it's different in the fact that all they're doing now is they're just not paying you. So instead of paying you the full amount of your retired pay, I'm going to pay you 60%, and I'm just not going to pay you the other amount. So what they're saying there is there's no taxable event for not paying you. And technically, you are you got paid before and you paid taxes on it. Now you're just being paid 60%, let's say, and you're paying taxes on it. But you're not really getting, you're not having to pay back the money is what's happening here. You're just not being paid the money. Uh, it's, it's a difficult concept, but it's the way the tax code is written on this thing. And so they paid you 50 grand, let's just say, and now they they get 50 grand back to fill the hole in their accounting books. And it's not a, it's not where they're really taking the money back. They're just not paying you is what it is on that. And so you got the benefit of the 50 grand with the tax money, and now you're going to get paid what you're going to pay you until uh, and not withhold amount of money until you pay that back. Uh, I've written many an article on this, and I've written articles that explain it better than I just explained it over the air because I'm trying to keep this short. Uh, go to the MOA website and read some of my articles on it. it. It goes into better detail, and maybe at that, I think I do a better job of explaining the logic behind it and why it's not double taxation like some people think it is. Okay, we've passed the end time. I'll th this will be the last question that we'll answer, and then we'll we'll terminate the the webinar. Tricare for Life requires that retirees sign up for Medicare Part B as soon as they are Medicare eligible. Well, Tricare for Life doesn't require that. It's you have to get, if you want healthcare, you either got to purchase Medicare Parts A and B, or you you, you purchase a a, a uh, Medicare Advantage plan. The IRMA for Medicare Part B, that's the additional, the, the change in based on your income of what you pay over the minimum amount, um, can be 772 per month, 
total for a retiree and their spouse when they have an adjusted gross income of 270 per year. Does MOA plan to address this to exclude military retired pay from IRMA calculations? As, as Shane just said in the last answer, um, that's not something that's ever that, that the IRS is gonna change their rules for. So I do, it's not on our priority list. Uh, I will pass this your concern up to our government relations team, but uh, I think that would be a long shot for that to occur. Shane, you want to wrap us up? All righty. Well, folks, we really appreciate your time and attention and participation today with the MOA webinar. Uh, make sure you download the handouts, folks. The handouts are out there. Look on your control panel. You see the handouts out there. Download the handouts, and the slides are part of the handouts that are out there. Wait for the survey at the end of this, and thank you very much for your time and effort today, and maybe we'll see you in a, in, listen in a future webinar, and you'll even get to maybe see us in video, which is kind of a scary thought. But anyhow, thank you very much, folks. Y'all take care. Stay safe, everybody.